Good afternoon, and welcome to the Center Stage Seminar Series event. My name is Tiffany Willoughby, Research Education Programs and Outreach Manager in the Office of Research at the University of Texas at Dallas. I will be your moderator. Joining me today is Dr. Dennis Kratz. Dr. Dennis M. Kratz is the Ignacy and Celia Rockover Professor of Humanities, Senior Associate Provost and Founding Director of the Center for Asian Studies at the University of Texas at Dallas, where he served as Dean of the School of Arts and Humanities from 1997 to 2019. His research emphasizes the continuation and transformation of the Western heroic tradition from classical antiquity through medieval and modern culture. He studies the ways in which artists and cultures seek both to maintain the essential qualities of that inheritance and make it a vehicle, sometimes inappropriately, for the expression of new values. He has published four books as well as numerous articles and reviews on subjects including heroism, epic poetry, medieval literature, translation, translation theory, science fiction, and the convergence of Western and Asian cultures. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Dennis Kratz as he takes center stage in the spotlight. Dr. Kratz, welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here to address the center stage series and to speak about the Center for Asian Studies and not to mention to put on a tie for the first time since March 14th, when we were all sent home. Uh, one uh, next slide, please, will be um, the one of the aspects of Asian culture that intrigues me and that I've tried to adopt in my own thought is rather than beginning immediately from individual and specific questions to start with an overview based on larger philosophic principles and try to set the overall context for what we're doing. Uh, next slide. As some of you, as most of you may know, I'm a student of Western rather than Asian culture. But at this point, let me, let me remind you of some connections between the two. As a classicist, one of the most important phrases uh, in my intellectual history was said sometime around 500 BC by a Greek philosopher named Heraclitus. The Greek is panta re, and what Heraclitus was saying was everything is moving, everything is flowing. Um, he made the famous uh, analogy, you can't step in the same river twice because it's continuously flowing, it's a different river. Intriguingly, about the same time, Confucius stood on a riverbank in China and said, as he watched a river flow by, is not life like this con con continuously flowing and moving? I almost like to believe that it was the same day around 500 before the Comet era that both of them said this. It's an important concept to keep in mind because as everything is flowing, if everything is moving, and certainly we know that is true in the universe that we know today, then everything I know is partial and provisional and is subject to change, subject to continuous reconstruction of my own knowledge, my own thought, my own attitudes. And yet, as human beings, we have this innate love of categorizing and freezing knowledge into moments and believing that those moments make sense. I've put up on my first slide two maps of the world as a way of pointing out that our knowledge is not only contextual by the time in which we live, but by the place in which we learn something and the context in which we know it. Here you have two maps of the earth, one that I grew up with that places North America and the Americas in the center. And Asia, in fact, both 
on both sides of it, split in half, if you will. The second map is the world as Asians see it, with Asia in the center, Asia in the middle. Uh, the, the symbol for China, as you know, was uh, the symbol of the center, because China considered itself the central kingdom, the middle kingdom. Um, how does it affect what I know if I have an assumption that I, in America, am in the center, rather than China and Asia being in the center? You know, I spent uh, six years of my life in Boston, Massachusetts, which thought it was not only the center of the globe, but the center of the universe. Maps give us a static belief that what we have, what we see and what we write down is true and it's accurate. Even a map is a relative statement that can divide uh, Asian from Western viewpoints. It's what's called a social imaginary, the complex of assumptions that we walk around with, some personal, some cultural, some national, that make assumptions about what's normal behavior, what's beautiful, what's reasonable, what's uh, acceptable and what's criminal. And it varies from place to place and also from time to time. So I'd like to keep in mind that part of the reason that the Center for Asian Studies was begun was to move us away and move myself away from what I call a Western-centric notion of what's right and what's wrong. Uh, next slide. So to begin, since all knowledge I'm saying is at least partial and provisional, and certainly all aesthetic, all moral, all cultural judgments are conditioned by the place in which they're known and by the cultural context, I thought it would be good to start with something that we can all agree on. And what you see here is a scientific formula that is true in China, true in Dallas, true in South America, that it's true. And it's the formula for what I call my favorite equation. Um, this is, for those of you who are uh, in the sciences, you already know this is torque. Uh, one way of saying torque is torque equals the, the force times the radius times the angle between the force and the lever arm that's applied. Torque is a measure of force that can cause an object to rotate around an axis. It also creates a kind of force that can be applied and directed. If you're, if you're moving something, the force comes perpendicular. It's a, it's a fascinating concept to me because it's about how forces can expand and increase themselves by the way in which they're applied. Um, I, I learned force from talking with my dear friend Wolfgang Linder, who was long on the faculty of UT Dallas. And we talked about how it can be applied to multiple kinds of forces that work with, away from, or toward each other. So think of two forces. Okay? If they are going parallel to each other, they don't increase, they don't have much effect on each other. If they are going against each other, then usually that's not a good thing. That can be an accident, that can be harm. Um, it's very good if you're looking for the Higgs boson. The most powerful way that forces can unite is at a proper angle. If forces meet at a proper angle, then, if you'll pardon the pun, because you know what torque does, causes things to rub off, revolutions can occur. And force, power comes from that that enables cars and motors and other things to operate. So the reason I, the reason I bring up torque is, next slide, 
is the philosophy of education that lies behind actually personally all of my thought, um, my uh, my philosophy that, that uh, underlay my years as dean and now is really the underlying principle for the Center for Asian Studies. And that is, if you'll pardon another digression, I think we make a mistake in education by thinking of it in terms of a gathering of subject matters. Okay. Uh, we take literature or you take science or you take uh, performance art uh, or you take sociology and we generally build our notion of an education around building this sequence of subject matters. Uh, I prefer to think of education not as a gathering of subjects, but as a convergence of forces. Uh, in my mind, there are three powerful sources of human cognitive understanding. The first is our innate desire to make sense of the world, to see what's operating in the physical world, in the natural world, why what happens, happens. Torque is an example. But that's only one of three innate human drives. The second, and think of these not as nouns or as subject matters, but as activities. Sciencing is the activity of seeking explanations for the forces and processes at work in the natural world. Arting, if you will, is the process by which we take the ordinary and invest it with specialness, to give it meaning, to give it beauty, to make life more than existence. And we all do that, just as we all seek understanding of the natural world every day, we all do something every day to make our life a little bit more special. Dance is making movement more special. Music is making sound more special. Poetry, narrative, is making words more special. Now, the third force is what I call the humanities. The humanities refers to the third innate process that we all involve ourselves in. And that is we study and we think about the processes, all of them, by which we endow life with meaning and significance. So it's not about taking a humanities course or taking a science course or taking some art courses. Education to me and the role of the university is to foster in every student and every individual in every community in the nation an ability to channel these three forces think of the concept of torque to have them converge in our minds and in society in such a way that deepens the reservoir of understanding and enhances our ability to engage in multiple kinds of understanding, multiple kinds of thinking. No one of these three operates or exists independent of the others. Since just yesterday, Sir Roger Penrose received the Nobel Prize in physics and Roger Penrose for many years collaborated with Professor Wolfgang Rindler, whom I mentioned earlier as the source of my torque metaphor. It's important to realize that both of them were dealing with uh, Einstein's theory of relativity and Einstein's theory of relativity began in some respects with an artful story, an artful image by Einstein who imagined what it would be like to ride the light beam. And of course, the theory of relativity became involved in the arts, became absorbed into the very question of what is a human being? What's our place in this newly reconstructed universe? 
So that will explain the goal of the Center for Asian Studies in two ways. One, not just to study Asia, not just to, if you will, build a bridge between Asia, whatever Asia is, and the United States and Texas, not just to create programming between the two, but in some ways to encourage the convergence of Asian thought, Asian concepts, Asian view of life, Asian science, arts, humanities with Western American Texan views of the world. It's it's not diversity if you just put people together. That's variety. To have true diversity, you must have a convergence of ideas and thoughts and interaction. So the Center for Asian Studies has a goal of not just understanding, but engagement, interaction, and convergence of two cultures. And it's not just about Asia. The other part I should tell you, I will tell you later about the Center for Asian Studies is that our focus is, focus is not only on cultures of Asia, but very specifically also on the culture of what we'll call Asian America. The, those Asian who, hear, who are here in Texas, intermarried, intermingling with, with others' cultures to create what is truly going to be a new kind of world culture. So that's kind of, the, that's the philosophic origin of the Center for Asian Studies. Convergence, to see our role as bringing together forces of understanding, not just subject of study. Next slide, please. I thought now it would be useful since the Center for Asian Studies is the newest center at UTD, we were established on September 1st, uh, 2019. We've just celebrated our first anniversary. And it's important to say where we come from. Now, you can see where the issue of convergence and balance is always going to be present uh, in our discussions. I spent many years as dean trying to balance and encourage a convergence at utd which is known for science and engineering and business to have an equal have an equal commitment to those other two forces the humanities and the art to bring all of that together to form a university that truly uh, was a beacon of excellence well, this new center reflects my desire to create a balance between East and West. Uh, next slide. The center began, uh, I can trace its origins back uh, a number of years, but let's trace the origins back also to a fact. The context of the world has changed starting in the late 20th century. There is a notion of the tw late 20th and early 21st centuries as, quote, the Asian century. Uh, whether that is an accurate term or not, it is very clear that in the late 20th century, Asia has arisen to become a force in the world not just economic, not just military, not just political, but also artistic, philosophic, ethical. In every way, the world in the last 30 and 40 years has become, in my view, more balanced so that it's not a West with the East on the periphery or Asia with America on the periphery, it's a world of total interconnection and interaction. Now, it's no secret that the world in recent years that we once imagined to be a global village, a dynamic interwoven system 
is particularly in the last five or six years turning inward nations politics religions education even have become more isolated and fragmented toward nationalism and in education toward more of a focus on specific discipline and the danger of that is that isolated within the comfort of walled in fragments we can grow more convinced that we are right and the other must be wrong that other opinions somehow threaten ours rather than as forces blending with ours make us all stronger so the vision of that that now has become the center for asian studies began with the rise of the asian century as the dean of arts and humanities i was becoming aware of the imbalance of our school that we were I'm a Western centric scholar, as I'll explain later, and became aware and looking for a way to create that balance. Next slide. In, oh, oh let, me, let me point out also the reason I was looking for that balance is if you look, you will see that the Asian population in, in America and in the West uh, and in Texas is significantly growing. Okay? The state of Texas in 2018 had 5% of Asian uh, non-Hispanic population. A year later, it was 7%. I th Asian uh, peoples, and that's the entirety of Asia, um, is, is one of the fastest growing, quote, minorities uh, in the United States. The other fact, next slide, that struck me as important was the growing importance of Asian American culture. Um, we, you, you just have to um, look around you at UT Dallas and see the rainbow of students that we have, the up to 30% Asian American students, the growth of Asian American literature and art and political influence that always must be seen in the context of a long tradition in America of anti-Asian feeling and concern that today is part of the toxic atmosphere between the United States uh, and China. Um, I just have on the screen uh, uh, a book called Yellow Peril is a study of the history of anti-Asian sentiment in America. It's, a, it's an important read. The Chinese Must Go is the story of the exclusion of Chinese from America and the West Coast in the late 19th century, an issue that we still must deal with. And Interior Chinatown, a novel by Charles Yu, and I we're hopeful, because uh, if the COVID-19 allows it, that Charles Liu will be on our campus next uh, this coming spring to give a major address. Interior Chinatown is a novel about the stereotypes in which we place Chinese and Asian citizens. And just last week, it was named one of five books on the short list for the uh, National Book Award. Next slide. As I mentioned, I was looking for a way to resolve a problem. How could we increase our commitment to the study of Asian cultures, languages, peoples? And in 2007, uh, by chance, I was invited to a dinner of uh, honoring a, a group of visiting of, uh, um, dignitaries from China, members of the Ministry of Education. Um, at that dinner, I was discussing matters of the difficulty of translating China into English because I was the editor then of a journal on translation. And the Minister of Education turned to me and said, you should start a Confucius Institute. And in my, in my unsophisticated way, I said, what's that? And he explained to me that this was a new uh, endeavor by the 
People's Republic of China to create partnerships around the world with universities and other educational institutions to foster the study of China's history, art, culture, and language. Uh, the Uni University of Texas at Dallas established the first Confucius Institute in Texas in 2007, and it was a, a positive and productive part of our university until 2019, uh, when we closed it in order to transform the notion of a China Institute into an international uh, institute interested in all of Asia. I should say that when we started the Confucius Institute, it was always with the, with the concept that it would be a stepping stone ultimately to a larger uh, Asian Studies Institute. And in my mind, eventually a global studies institute. Now, many of you are probably, next slide. Many of you are probably aware that the Confucius Institutes have beca became subsequently highly controversial and now many of them in the United States are closed. We closed ours, as I say, in order to create this larger image. We had hoped to find a way to expand our focus beyond China. Uh, by the way, I should point out that in the years that it operated, the Confucius Institute sponsored multiple international conferences on academic subjects. Uh, two of those conferences, I'm pleased to say, resulted in uh, well-regarded academic books. The first on the problem of translating Chinese literature, language, and culture for, Western, for Westerners to understand and a second on the continuing relevance of Chinese philosophy through the world. Well, as I said, partly because we were looking for a way to expand our Asian imprint, if you will, and partly, candidly, because of the toxic environment that had arisen between China and the United States, we decided we would like to expand our, our vision. Fortunately, at that moment, next slide. Uh, okay, um, I th think we're ahead. Try the next slide. Yes, I want to go. I want to use this slide next. At the moment when we were in negotiation with the administration to convert the Confucius Institute into a larger concept, the negotiations to acquire the Crow Museum of Asian Art were also ongoing. And it was that decision, that acquisition, that enabled us to realize the next step in the evolution of Asian studies at the University of Texas at Dallas. The Crow Museum is the perfect partner for the Center for Asian Studies. Without the Crow Museum, we're hamstrung because we're only about history and business and science and literature. With the Crow Museum, we have that other half of culture, the visual arts. We have a community partner to link with us. Uh, and I can't over, I cannot overestimate the importance of the acquisition of the Crow Museum. And in my mind, the importance of the acquisition of the Crow Museum and its flourishing for the Center for Asian Studies and for that partnership for the future of the University of Texas at Dallas. Previous slide. And that led to the establishment of the Center for Asian Studies at UT Dallas. And September 1st, uh, 2019 was our first, was our opening day. Uh, the timing was perhaps less than ideal since it was three months later that parts of Asia would be shutting down and that in essence, we've been in a state of almost suspended animation since then as we hope for the world to open again. But it was the Again, a convergence of forces, the force of the Center for Asian Studies possibility with the force of the Crow Museum of Asian Art 
that made the Center for Asian Studies possible. Next, uh, next slide. And then one more. The mission of the Center for Asian Studies is easy to describe and hard to realize. Our goal is to promote knowledge and engagement. Knowledge, understanding, because knowledge and understanding and engagement ultimately, we believe, will lead to a deeper kind of wisdom of the two cultures for each other. With the diverse cultures of Asia and Asian America, we have a, if you will, a uh, stereo vision to study Asia as a country, but also to have our focus clearly on the importance and the contribution and the growth of Asian American culture. The ways in which we will realize this mission include sponsoring educational research and public outreach programs. We hope and plan to serve as a catalyst for collaboration across disciplines, areas of study, academic approaches, modes of creative practice. If you will, we hope to be a place for the convergence of multiple forces of cognitive understanding and the creation, expression, and performance of new international values. And finally, through fundraising and through other activities, we intend to increase the resources and the opportunities, not only for our students to study, but for our faculty to engage in study and research related to Asia and Asian America. That's our commitment. That's our goal. Next slide. Just to show you that this is a university center and that our goal again is to converge the forces of multiple areas of the university. It's difficult to find any significant area of UT Dallas that is not already engaged with Asia and Asian America. Every school that we contacted has a program or study related to Asia. Many of our centers at the university study and deal and have connections with Asia. Our goal is to bring them all together, to interweave them so that the conversations across schools and across disciplines can create new kinds of thinking and new kinds of projects. Um, our, we have a very close partnership already with uh, the School of Economic, Political and Policy Sciences, uh, with the, the, uh, the Jindal School of Management uh, and others. We, we are open, we want to be a, uh, the German word is a Treffpunkt, a place where everyone can meet and in meeting, exchange ideas and in exchanging ideas, create new kinds of educational programming. Uh, next slide. I'd like to, you know, a, a, a center is people. And I'd like to show you the wide range of individuals who have already uh, offered their support and advice to the school. I'd like to pay, pay special tribute to our very focused and small staff. I have Sharon Yang, who's the assistant director of the Center for Asian Studies, was for 13 years the, the administra assistant director of the Confucius Institute. She is as well liked, as well known and admired throughout the, the local Asian community as anyone, she's invaluable. And also for my administrative assistant, Olivia Kong, who joined in January and has already uh, proved um, adept and brilliant at times and extremely capable of creating first rate visuals for me with very little notice. Uh, next slide. 
we have an administrative committee that is my basic kitchen cabinet. Dr. Ming Dong Gu is the associate director and in charge of liaisons with uh, the People's Republic of China. Uh, Dr. Gu, for all the years of the Confucius Institute, was its director. He was a visionary. He was responsible for creating powerful partnerships that continue in China with Southeast University and Nanjing University and a wide range of Chinese scholars who we have brought and will continue to bring to UTD. Dr. Carl Ho is the associate director. Dr. Ho's specific responsibility is, is to build liaisons and be the relationship with the government of Taiwan. Um, next slide. The other members of the administrative committee are Dr. Ted Harpam, who's the head of the honor, director, uh, dean of the Wildenthal Honors College and director of the honors program. And uh, a dear friend and my other good friend, the executive director of the Crow Museum, Amy Lewis Hofflin. Next slide. Dr. Jennifer Holmes, Dean of the School of uh, Economic, Political and Policy Sciences, and Dr. Michael Thomas, the new director of the Edith O'Donnell Institute of Art History. Next slide. Also on the administrative committee ex officio is the head of my international advisory committee for the center, Dr. Dashwan Feng. Uh, some of you will recognize Dr. Feng, who for many years was the vice president for research at the University of Texas at Dallas. And in fact, the gentleman who invited me to that dinner in 2007, when I first encountered the opportunity to start a China studies program. Next slide, I'm gonna show you some of the members of the uh, faculty advisory board drawn from almost every school uh, at UTD, Roger Molina from the School of uh, ATEC, Dr. Jiyong Park from Behavioral and Brain Sciences, Dr. Porus Basara from the, uh, from the Johnson School of Engineering and Computer Science. Uh, uh, you will notice also drawn from a number of Asian communities and countries. Next slide, Mike Peng, and Hubert Zadorik from JSON, Dr. Ravi Prakash from also from the Johnson School. Next slide. Take Hoon Kim, department head and associate professor in the School of Natural Sciences and Mathematics, along with Dr. Robert Stern, Bob Stern, professor of geosciences. You will notice this is a center looking to draw on and converge the understanding of multiple schools in multiple ways. And my friend, Dr. Jacqueline Chow, who is the senior curator of Asian art at the Crow Museum. Next slide. Now to the International Advisory Board with Dr. Dashwan Feng. Drawn from Dallas through Asia, Amos Muscatwala is a leader of the Indian American community and member of the Director of Faith Forward Dallas, Bing Shia, Senior Vice President of Worldwide Sales at Texas Instruments. Next slide. Charlie, uh, well, we skipped. <laughs> Go back one, I think that, okay, well, I'm sorry, next slide. Uh, Go Yan, Vice President of Beijing University of Foreign Studies. Bali Deepak, a professor of Chinese at Yarwahalo. Nehru University in India, Dr. Michael Shanyi, who is the director of the Fairbanks Center for Chinese Studies at Harvard University. Next slide. Charlie and Pauline Chen, leaders of the Taiwanese community and founders of DFW Technology. Dr. Jonathan Stalling, who's the chair, uh, who's the Harold and Ruth Newman chair for U.S.-China Issues and the Director of the United States China Center at Oklahoma University. Next slide. Chasman Gates, Legal Counsel from TI. Stephanie Schneidler, a local philanthropist who
whose family um, has established the An Lin Ku lecture series on Chinese culture. Professor Kidder Smith, from Bo who started Chinese studies at Bowdoin University. Next slide. And Paul Pass, executive director of the Japan American Society. Dr. Peter Matheson, the president of the University of Edinburgh in Scotland, and a local attorney, uh, Jordan Kalman, with whom I've traveled throughout Asia over the year. Next slide. I hope that gives you an idea of the range of vision and the diversity of goals, all focused on knowledge leading to understanding, understanding leading to wisdom, wisdom leading to harmony and collaboration, and again, convergence of forces. Very briefly, what we're up to. Next slide. In our first year, despite the shutdown, we managed to take care of some important uh, events. We sponsored the with the School of Arts and Humanities up on the upper left. That is a lecture by Dr. Ying Ying Chang, who's not only an eminent uh, biologist in her own right, but the mother of the independent scholar Iris Chang, who wrote a groundbreaking and earth-shaking book about the uh, Nanjing massacre during World War II. We sponsored, uh, well, this is a lecture that I gave uh, earlier this spring, uh, trying to imagine the union of Western and Eastern images of heroism, something that's become very important to my thinking. And finally, down at the bottom, you see the, the Center for Asian Studies has created a new course within the UT Dallas curriculum. It started, it has started as a one hour honor seminar um, introducing students to the concept of Asian studies. It consists of a series of visitors addressing different issues in Asian, in Amer Asian American studies. Okay, next slide to tell you what our plans are, and then I want to, I hope there'll be some questions. We are in the midst of preparing our first international conference and meeting. Um, it's devoted to natural beauty, the natural beauty of mineral art that is extraordinarily important, plays an extraordinarily important role in Asian culture. Um, we're trying to focus it on three aspects. Uh, natural art means minerals and, and pieces of it. This is the Arkenstone Gallery, which specializes in found natural minerals that that in fact are presented as works of art. Natural art in Asia, such as scholar stones, such as these found minerals, um, we're calling it natural beauty, and we're going to call it natural beauty studied, displayed, and purchased to look at the science, the scientific, the artistic, and the commercial implications of the role of minerals and stone in Asian culture and relate that to American culture. We have, next slide, some other concepts that we'll be looking at, um, what, what we're calling Asian and Asian American futures. UT Dallas is a university devoted to the natural sciences and to engineering. So we're going to look at the future of Asia and the future of Asian America both through extrapolation and through the growing body of Asian and Asian American science fiction and futurist fiction. Um, a second initially planned program is called Converging Voices. We discovered that most of what Americans know about Asia are books and studies by Americans. And in a corollary fact that much of what Asians come to know about America comes from Asian authors. 
Our goal is again convergence, to bring together Americans and Asians studying, writing about, doing creative fiction about the same subjects so they can share their insights from their culture into our culture to create a deeper kind of understanding. And finally, in the long run, the role of uh, perhaps from the sublime to the less sublime, from minerals as art to opium, a study of the impact of the opium trade in the 19th and early 20th century on United States Asian relations. Well, I'll leave it there. It's um, just about 345, I think. And I'd like to leave time for questions from anyone in the audience. Uh, thank you for your attention. And now, uh, Tiffany, can I throw the microphone open? Is there anybody with any interest? Yes, yeah. we do have questions in the queue, Dr. Kratz, and it seems like we have a little feedback, so I'm going to mute you while I deliver it, and then if you could unmute to answer, please. So the first question is, in relation to the Venn diagram you showed earlier on in your presentation, should it be everyone's goal to exist in the center of your Venn diagram between science, humanities, and arts, and how does this relate to Eastern ideas in comparison to Western ideas? Please unmute to answer the question and thank you. That's a great question. Uh, I, yes, my idea, I don't know if it's the center, but I think all of us, whether we intend to or not, exist, yes, at that convergence point. Uh, I know of no individual who does not engage in proto-science, at least, who isn't in some way an artist of her own life. And certainly there is no human being who is not engaged in the study of endowing our lives with meaning. Yes, I think that the goal of education should be to nurture that union. Um, humanities without science is useless. Science without a humanistic aspect to it is socially, I won't say use it, but it's, it's more dangerous. And without art, there is no life. So, so yes, and I, I have found in Asia, uh, particularly in my travels in China and Korea, and to a lesser extent in Japan, that though they don't express it the same way, the, the individuals I know see this convergence as a part of their life. Now, in Asia, the education, unfortunately, in higher education is even more fragmented than it is in the United States. The, the humanities are often on different campuses from the sciences and the arts are separated out. Um, I believe the United States and Western education as education is in advance of where Asian education is at this point um, in terms of this convergence. I also believe that the United States is dismantling that convergence in our educational system increasingly, that our goal is increasingly considered success and usually success in economic terms. Um, I think that um, the knowledge of science is essential. And if you look at this, I believe uh, engineering is a convergence of all three. Uh, certainly business is a convergence of all three. So, so the long-winded answer is yes. I would like to see every individual right there uh, in the center of that uh, triad. Thank you for your thorough answer, Dr. Kratz. Next question in the queue, bear with me, it is a bit lengthy. There have been numerous headlines detailing attempts to commandeer ownership from firms with ties to Asian American families and close 
related educational institutions and programs. How may the recent attempts at UT Dallas, those focused on promoting discussion of inclusiveness and acceptance of ethnic diversity best face the consistent anti-foreign business growth rhetoric espoused by one members of the of one majority within American political discourse without going so far as to turn a blind eye by accepting funds procured through illegitimate means, as has been undertaken by members of other majority with American political discourse. And I will ask you to unmute again, apologies. Well, thank God we got an easy question with no political um, a controversy involved with it. You know, in just a few minutes, I can't answer that question because if, if and, and I hope to meet soon the person who, who asked it, because if you, if you listen to the question, it makes certain assumptions, okay? Uh, I'm a student of language. The assumption of the language is, is that there is a toxic relationship. And I would agree there are real problems between uh, the United States, uh, and it sounds specifically like China, um, and they need to be addressed. But I also believe that there's a danger from not knowing each other, of not only being, of placing ourselves in walled in fragments, uh, which I, and, and again, seeing these two forces as at war almost, nothing good will come of that. We, and if you're in a walled in fragment, I'm not only right, I'm righteous. Um, and the other person is not only wrong, they're dangerous. What I can tell you is, in my experience, that does not, what you're saying, is not as appropriate or accurate with regard to the academic world as it is to the political world. Um, I ran a, uh, I was the uh, dean in charge of a Confucius Institute for 13 years, and I can tell you there was no spying uh, there was no um, insidious attempt to destroy American values. Um, this is unpolitical. We're doing a good enough job of that on our own. Um, we must find a way of, around and about to, to end that toxicity. Science you know, I started on purpose with a scientific formula. Science should not be politicized. Okay. A, you know, there's a new phrase I heard recently. Uh, if you'll forgive me, there's a phrase, blacks driving, <laughs> driving while black as a dangerous uh, thing. And, uh, I heard the phrase doing science while Asian. Um, centers like ours exist to find a way to detoxify the relationship. Yes, there's theft going on. Uh, yes, there's spying going on on both sides. Okay. Yes, there are political fights going on, but the universities and other institutions of higher learning and higher being need to find ways not to let that become permanent. Because let me remind everyone that no enmities and no friendships between nations are permanent. Last year's, uh, last century's enemy uh, is, this, is this century's collaborative partner. Uh, I, I, I started this century, it's not about China, remember, this is India, this is Vietnam, this is Central Asia, this is Kazakhstan. Uh, Asia extends far, and no one knows where it ends, is to find a way to remind us all we're members of the same fraternity, and that's the fraternity of mortality. Uh, 
Uh, so I'm sorry to turn to a term, but I'd love to discuss this further because um, these issues can't be swept under the rug, but they certainly can't be used as a bludgeon to create fear. Remember that Asian American population in the United States are our, are our fellow citizens, our friends, our colleagues, our partners, and to allow, and both parties are responsible for this, to allow a politicizing so that they immediately feel distrusted uh, is not right, not appropriate, and not ethical. Thank you, Dr. Kratz. Um, there is another question in the queue here. Very simple and easy to answer. Does the center offer classes in different Asian languages? Perfect question. Yes. <laughs> the Center for Asian Studies. Now, the School of Arts and Humanities offers credit languages. I'm very proud of this. Uh, the uh, the, the language of uh, studying in UT Dallas, the, the most enrolled language is, of course, Spanish. The second most enrolled language is Japanese. The third most enrolled language is Chinese. The fourth most enrolled language is Arabic. And then there's German and French. <laughs> so, yes, we offer all of those for credit. On the non-credit community level, the Center for Asian Studies this fall is offering beginning and intermediate Chinese. We're offering Japanese. And for the first time, we're offering Hindi lessons to the community. We're hoping also to add Korean language for the community next fall. Uh, our numbers were diminished a bit by the coronavirus and the fact that all of this is online. But the happy answer is, Yes, we will, and we will continue to. Thank you. And two additional questions that I have for you at this time before we wrap up. Does the Center for Asian Studies offer study abroad programs to places like Korea, Japan, or China? And how can students get involved in research projects with the Center for Asian Studies? The Center for Asian Studies, remember, is barely a year old. Um, and at this point, we don't offer such opportunities. Uh, frankly, they don't exist at the moment. No one is traveling to Asia. Um, our goal is to, again, partner with international studies at UT Dallas, with the Wildenthal Honors College to, to help promote such activities. Uh, yes, our goal is to expand them. There are activities, there are opportunities now to study in Asia. Uh, we intend to expand them, not necessarily by offering them ourselves, but by providing support to the university and to the schools in the university that offer such opportunities. Thank you very much, Dr. Kratz. We had one final question before we carry on, and that is how was the pandemic and quarantine affected, or how has it affected the way the organization operates? Well, as I mentioned at the beginning, we've been in a state akin to suspended animation since really November of last year uh, when the pandemic hit uh, Wuhan and China, at that point, um, our activities dried up. Um, we've, we hope to, to initiate a few things, but I, I doubt they'll be, that we'll be at full strength and running on full fuel, if you will, before the fall of 2021. Uh, we're offering, we offer online lectures uh, I gave an online lecture a week and a half ago. There is an online lecture of Japanese culture through manga and anime in early November. We will be sponsoring, we're working now to sponsor an online lecture about Indian uh, Chinese relations uh, by one of our board members. Uh, and in the spring, we'll be sponsoring, along with the School of Arts and Humanities, a visit by uh, Charles Yu and another Chinese American author uh, to speak as the online Ku lecturer. But these projects that I've mentioned 
particularly the project on uh, natural beauty will be perhaps in the fall of 2021, more likely February 2022. Uh, I think the world's going to be slow in gearing up. I know I had numerous visits to create partnerships with Taiwan um, and, it, and, and India scheduled, but uh, we have no idea when they will take place. Oh, and if students are interested, contact me. We are creating a third advisory board, the Student Advisory Council, that already has three three people signed up, and I'm they're going to be leading the uh, recruitment of others. I'd like to have that named by the end of this semester and operant and meeting uh, remotely at the beginning. Uh, early next semester. So there will be a student board to help us reach our goals more effectively and more quickly. Thank you very much, Dr. Kratz, for sharing your time, talent, and resources with the attendees and the community at large. For additional information and a comprehensive list of Office of Research events, please visit research.utdallas.edu. Thank you and have a nice afternoon.